Okay, so uh, let us try to uh, see if we can wind up our discussion of non-equilibrium Green's function. So, uh, remember that uh, I told you that you see the point is that regardless of whether the system is in equilibrium, uh, by that I mean you know the system has a Hamiltonian that is time independent and it could possibly be uh, coupled to some uh, reservoir at some finite temperature or it can be coupled to a reservoir which is not only at a finite temperature but also at some finite chemical potential. So, implying therefore that uh, the system can uh, exchange part both particles and energy with the surroundings. So, if that is the case uh, and even if that is not the case even for a truly isolated system the uh, quantities of interest uh, especially with respect to the one particle Green's function would necessarily be the uh, particle and whole Green's functions because after all that is all there is to it. Is, you see you either calculate this uh, or you calculate the other thing. So, this corresponds to a particle Green's function, this would correspond to whole Green's function. So, uh, the only difference is that you see the um, this bracket has different meanings depending upon the situation. So, if the system is truly isolated, this bracket uh, obviously means expectation value with respect to ground state. But if uh, the system is not isolated, for example, if the system is a grand canonical uh, a part of a grand canonical ensemble that means the system is not only exchanging energy with surroundings it is also exchanging particles with surroundings so that it uh, you know comes to an equilibrium with a chemical potential and temperature that is uh, common to both the system and the surroundings. Then uh, you see the, uh, uh, the average the brackets here I am talking about the, for the particle and whole Green's function they have a different meaning namely it is not merely the expectation value it is actually the trace over all possible uh, states of the system with an appropriate uh, weight which is uh, similar to the Boltzmann weight if it were merely canonical. So, it is basically e raise to minus beta h minus mu n that is what it would be. So, it is basically uh, it is a weighted uh, average over uh, all the states of the system not merely the ground state. So, um, so th that is all you have to keep in mind that basically uh, that is the only difference between a truly isolated system versus a system that is uh, uh, in contact with some surroundings. So, the meaning of the brackets differ, but otherwise uh, it in both situations uh, you are simply called upon to calculate uh, either the particle Green's function or the whole Green's function that is all there is to it. You see if you are allowed to remove a particle or insert one particle or remove one particle then after all that is the only thing you can calculate uh, either you calculate the particle Green's function where you insert a particle first or you calculate the whole Green's function where you remove a particle first. But the point is that uh, you see that uh, the fact that there are two different such Green's functions that you have to calculate um, becomes inconvenient when uh, you are trying to solve uh, see if your Hamiltonian typically will be uh, not exactly diagonalizable. Uh, for various reasons and the most serious reason being that uh, particles interact amongst themselves. Not only do they interact with possible external fields, but they also interact amongst themselves. So, when they interact amongst themselves the implication is that you would not uh, be able to handle it. So, you will have to expand in powers of uh, that interaction between particles. So, when you do that uh, you will necessarily uh, uh, be called upon to um, perform a perturbation series expansion. Now, when you do that uh, the problem is that it is not that much of a problem it is just uh, an annoyance. The fact that you have two different Green's function that you have to perturb and find the series expansion for is somewhat irritating. 
uh, but there is a more uh, i mean there is a deeper reason for why it is desirable to have uh, a kind of a, a single definition for a greens function which results in these two particle and whole greens function as special cases so the reason for uh, seeking uh, a more compact definition of uh, uh, the one particle greens function is because that compact definition will actually then obey an exact equation uh, even when interactions are present so and it will only involve that greens function and nothing else see right now if you try to write down the equation of motion for the particle greens function for example uh, you will uh, soon find that because the particles interact amongst themselves the equation of motion for the particle greens function will start to in involve uh, a greens function where you are going to be creating two particles and annihilating two particles so the the one particle greens function the equation of motion for the one particle greens function will involve two particle greens function and the equation of motion for the two particle greens function will involve three particle greens function and so on and so forth and endlessly and that is of course not convenient so it is better to uh, um, see if there is some way in which you can uh, have a situation where uh, the equation of motion for the one particle greens function will involve only the one particle greens function and not anything else so uh, so if you want to achieve that goal it is not going to be possible if you do the naive thing uh, or the obvious thing which is uh, deal with this uh, particle and whole greens function separately so it is important uh, in that case to uh, be clever about it so that means we are now going to introduce a uh, well i have already introduced that definition it's basically called the time ordered greens function so the time ordered greens function specifically uh, uh, if especially if you have non equilibrium uh, external fields then what happens is that you're called upon to uh, define them uh, in this peculiar way so the idea is that if uh, so the time ordered uh, greens function is uh, so so this c is called the keldish contour so what you are staring at here is called the keldish contour so the in the keldish contour uh, the times that i'm uh, referring to here t1 and t2 they basically live on uh, one of these branches so in the implication is that if suppose t2 is here on this branch this is called the lower branch that's called the upper branch for obvious reasons so this is upper and this is lower so if t2 is on the lower branch regardless of where t1 is on the so long as it's on the upper branch it doesn't matter where t1 is uh, t2 is always greater than t1 so if t2 is on the lower branch and t1 is on the upper branch it doesn't matter what the relative magnitudes of t1 and t2 are okay so t2 will always be greater than t1 so whereas uh, if both t1 and t2 are on the same branch then uh, t2 is said to be greater than t1 if uh, it is numerically greater than t1 and they are both on the upper branch but uh, t2 is greater than t1 if it is to the left of t1 if it's on the lower branch so basically on the upper branch t2 is greater than t1 if it is to the right of t1 so the implication is that you are going like this so so the path of increasing times is like this so this time is greater than this time is greater than this so this is always greater this is greater even greater even greater even greater even greater like that so so you are going like this so you are this is increasing times time is increasing like this so so this is called the keldish contour so if you decide uh, that your times uh, are in this defined in this peculiar way and then having done that you can always freeze the times to some numerical values 
so either so then what happens is that you see you will uh, you will end up getting uh, all these particle and whole greens functions so you suppose you want to uh, you don't care about this contour uh, ordered greens function you just want to extract uh, say the particle greens function all you do is simply put t2 on the lower branch t1 on the upper branch and you got your particle greens function so if you want the reverse you want a whole greens function so you see uh, if i put uh, t1 on the upper branch it is going to be to the left of uh, so time ordering means if t1 is greater than t2 in the sense of this contour so if t1 is greater than t2 on the contour it this is basically psi of x1 t1 psi dagger x2 t2 if if t1 is greater than t2 on the contour and it is uh, plus or minus uh, the other way psi dagger x2 t2 psi x1 t1 if uh, if t2 is greater than t1 plus minus depending upon whether it is boson or fermion. So, you see this is particle greens function this is whole greens function. So, this is on the contour. So, if you really uh, uh, so all you have to do is uh, if you want to get particle uh, greens function all you have to do is make sure that t1 is on the lower uh, branch and t2 is on the upper branch and regardless of the numerical values of t1 and t2 you will always be studying the particle greens function and suppose you uh, want the whole greens function uh, you make sure that t2 is on the lower branch and t1 is on the upper branch and regardless of now the numerical values so t2 can be as negative uh, or as positive as it wants and independently t1 can be anything so the point is once t2 is on the lower branch you will always be studying the whole greens function so long as t1 is on the upper branch so now if both are on the same branch then uh, you will be getting your usual time ordering uh, so if both are on the upper branch it you will get time ordering in the sense in which you normally expect if numerically t2 is larger then you will get a whole greens function and uh, if numerically t1 is larger you will get the uh, particle greens function um, yeah am i saying that right so if numerically uh, t1 is larger uh, then uh, this will be on the left and this will be on the right yeah so then you will get the particle greens function and numerically t2 is larger t2 will come to the left and you will make it the whole greens function so if t1 and t2 are on the upper branch uh, the ordering is same as the numerical ordering whichever is numerically larger uh, is also larger in the sense of time ordering so in time ordering means that it time ordering of a bracket t and b bracket t dash is uh, same as a into b if t is greater than t dash it's b into a if t dash is greater than t but that greater and lesser have different meanings depending upon the situation so if the times are on two different branches i told you what it is if they are on the same branch it is the same as numerical ordering if both are on the upper branch and it is the anti numerical ordering if they are on the lower branch that by that I mean if t1 is greater than t2 numerically it will be uh, regarded as uh, this t1 will be regarded as the smaller quantity if both are on the lower branch see so the numerical smallness will be uh, the contour largeness if they are on both are on the lower branch but if both are on the upper branch then the numerical largeness is same as contour largeness so if uh, if they are on different branches then the lower branch is always larger than the upper branch okay so that's all there is to it so that is the uh, keldish contour so you might think that why are we making a simple situation complicated because after all we had uh, a particle greens function a whole greens function so we could have simply lived with two different greens functions so we are struggling to uh, you know somehow combine these two greens function into one uh, contour ordered greens function it's not at all clear that that is worth the effort because it seems like a lot of effort 
So, you will see that it is uh, useful because you see in the end what will happen is that if you decide to uh, define contour ordering in this way then uh, you can uh, write down your contour order Green's function in the grand canonical ensemble uh, in this way and then the uh, this is your S matrix with respect to so if, if your fields evolve according to the part of the Hamiltonian that is independent of time the part of the Hamiltonian that depends on time can be absorbed into this S matrix and this S matrix is nothing but that part of the Hamiltonian which depends on time and it is again along the contour. So, now see when you do perturbation the series in this interaction term, so what this is going to do is that it is basically um, gives you a whole bunch of terms and uh, so there will be a whole bunch of terms in the denominator as well. But the point is that they will systematically um, cancel out the terms in the numerator where the fields actually couple. Uh, so, so, in other words that this is same as just uh, doing the numerator expansion, but keep remembering to throw away terms where these two get coupled. So, uh, yeah, I, I know that I have not spent enough time explaining to you how the perturbation series is supposed to be carried out. So, the idea is that you see the point is that when um, the uh, when you turn off this external fields, then uh, typically what will happen is that there is something called Wick's theorem which is applicable. So, Wick's theorem simply says. Uh, that if you want to calculate the average of A, B, C, D, so this is same as calculating the average of A into B times C into D or calculating average of A into C plus B into D like that. So, it is like uh, all sorts of pairings. So, it basically says um, that is what it says. So, if, uh, if mutual interactions between particles are absent then Wick's theorem is applicable. So, that means, uh, so whether it is uh, 4 or 6 or 8 or whatever it is because that is what will happen here. So, if this is for example, the interaction between particles it will involve density density. So, it will be a 4 fermion interaction you will have psi dagger psi dagger psi psi and uh, you will get uh, these types of terms and they will all pair like this. So, and one of those pairings will involve uh, pairing these two, but uh, and so once you pair up these two and take the average it becomes some number and goes outside and then you will end up having to deal with uh, only the operators that are sitting inside S. But the whole point is that that will exactly cancel the terms coming from the denominator. So, so even though um, superficially it seems like we have not really uh, achieved the uh, sort of uh, goal that we set out to achieve in the beginning namely that we wanted the S matrix to uh, appear exactly in one place, but it looks like there it still appears in two places. But now you see that is only um, superficially so because what this means is this is just a shorthand of for saying that even though it superficially appears in two places the implication is that when you do a perturbation series the terms in the numerator that correspond to coupling of the psi and psi dagger are to be consciously omitted while performing the uh, expansion. So, once, once you remember to consciously omit the terms that correspond to coupling of psi and psi dagger then you simply can afford to ignore this denominator entirely. So, then my original claim is then valid. So, that means the original claim was that uh, this way of doing uh, this way of defining Green's function will only involve S matrix in one place namely in the numerator. So, but that is uh, true so long as you remember to omit terms which in, in this expansion in the perturbation expansion you omit terms which involve um, pairing psi and psi dagger. So, if you omit those terms then 
even though superficially it appears that uh, the S matrix is there in both places numerator and denominator, it is practically it is there only in the numerator. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so if you are having trouble understanding these issues, uh, firstly I do not blame you because it is a lot of, uh, there is lot of details that I have uh, either omitted or implied and not explicitly worked out everything. Uh, so, that is something that uh, as a student you have to try on your own and uh, if you are simply unable to understand what I am talking about, uh, you really should be reaching out to me by email or asking me questions and uh, you know saying that look I do not know what you are talking about, you know explain it to me a little better. But uh, try and understand whatever I have explained till now as much as possible. So, whatever is remaining I can explain to you uh, separately through email and that sort of thing or your live sessions. But uh, you know I, I yesterday I had a live session I was somewhat disappointed because uh, I expected very specific technical questions but most of you did not come prepared to ask me specific technical questions. So, please come prepare to ask me specific technical questions next time. Okay, uh, so, the whole point is that this, uh, so one goal has been achieved namely that this way of defining the Green's function through this contour ordering in, in this grand canonical sort of ensemble picture uh, achieves this uh, goal of uh, ensuring that the perturbation series is done in a clean uh, economical way namely that you simply only expand one of the S matrices in the numerator perturbatively and then you start using your Wix theorem and pair up all the terms. But there is a deeper more uh, uh, a better reason for introducing uh, this definition this peculiar way of defining Green's functions through contour ordering. And that deeper more uh, convincing reason is because you can now derive a kind of an equation, it is called a functional differential equation. So, it is not the sort of differential equation that you are accustomed to, but it is a, it's a kind of uh, equation that uh, I think even mathematicians seldom encounter in their own research. But it is one of those uh, peculiar equations which involves both uh, conventional part partial derivatives as well as functional derivatives the sort of functional differentiation and integration I have been discussing in the last uh, few lectures. So, it involves both those equations, but the important uh, benefit to uh, thinking this way is that the equation uh, such a functional differential equation for this uh, contour ordered Green's function of this 1 10.103 1 will be such that it will only involve this Green's function back again, it will not involve anything else. So, in other words uh, see if you if you do not do it this way if you uh, if you insist on using your conventional the original naive and uh, even well it is it is uh, physically well motivated but uh, technically naive definition of uh, particle and Green's function as simply the average of psi and psi dagger or average of psi dagger and psi uh, even though that is physically well motivated it is technically naive because the equation of motion for those will involve uh, now uh, four point functions that means those are two point functions they will involve four point functions and then if you then go ahead and try to see what equations those four point functions will uh, obey, they will now involve six point function etcetera etcetera endlessly and that is not a desirable situation. So, you see uh, this, uh, so we have to be technically uh, clever also. So, we have to define the Green's function in a technically clever way so that the equation that you write down for that Green's function will not involve anything other than versions of itself. So, that is precisely what the Schwinger Dyson equation is basically it is an equation it is a functional differential equation uh, of the Green's function which involves other versions of itself. 
okay so uh, so how do you do that so you do that uh, by um, first uh, first let us see what is the system we are trying to study so the system we are trying to study is the following i want to study this system what is this system this is the usual kinetic energy but this is this is this will involve four fermions you see this is usually c dagger c is just kinetic energy but this involves this is the density of particles sitting at r dash and this is the same density of particle r and so in some sense it is basically the interaction of particles sitting at r and r dash and this is the mutual interaction potential energy and this half is there because you are counting it twice and you want to count only once uh, so uh, bottom line is that this is really what i want to study a, a collection of quantum particles that are mutually interacting by a two body pairwise potential called v of r minus r dash so uh, but so i want to find the greens function of such a system that's particle and whole greens function so the way i'm going to do this is uh, uh, in order for me to derive an equation for that greens function which doesn't involve anything but other versions of that greens function i'll be forced to introduce an external time dependent potential so now i'm see because this is merely a device to generate uh, the i mean basically it's a device to write down those uh, greens functions uh, i mean so write down those functional differential equations then uh, it is clear that uh, i uh, i am at liberty to choose this external time dependent field according to my convenience because after all in the end i intend to set it equal to zero because really speaking it's not there uh, the system is in equilibrium and uh, so i i'm introducing it because i want to uh, derive a functional differential equation for the greens function uh, which will involve this external time dependent field which will finally go away but uh, because it will finally go away and it's not really there i am putting it in for my own uh, technical convenience i am completely at uh, liberty to uh, choose its properties so specifically i'm going to um, postulate that this uh, this time dependent external potential u of r comma t is such that the times involved are also along the imaginary axis now i'm no longer going to be studying this keldish contour because see the keldish contour is useful when you have actual time dependent fields uh, which uh, which are uh, you know time varying in real time but this is some ex uh, mathematical device which i am introducing so because it's a mathematical device i can pretend that this time dependent external source also um, is meaningful only on the imaginary axis and uh, it's defined for times between t equal to 0 and t equals minus beta h bar okay so so physicists have this instinctive habit of setting h bar equals 1 i occasionally slip up and forget the h bar because in other places i have written h bar okay um, so the point is that uh, yeah so that's how i choose to introduce this external device this external field which is actually not there but i introduce it for my convenience and i'll finally get rid of it So now the question is if i decide that now this this is my combined hamiltonian uh, which now involves both the external field as well as the field which involves i mean as well as the kinetic energy of the particles and the mutual interaction potential energy now i can go ahead and ask myself what is the equation of motion obeyed by the uh the time dependent annihilation operator so clearly it's going to be this 
See, whereas uh, if, uh, the uh, the part of the Hamiltonian that evolves only according to the time independent part of the Hamiltonian will clearly obey this equation, right. So, the so the implication is that uh, these two are related through this sort of S matrix, ok. So, if, if your external field was 0, it, these two would coincide because uh, if u was 0 that these two are the same things. So, the hat refers to the time evolution purely with respect to the time independent part of the Hamiltonian. So, uh, I have spent some effort trying to convince you that uh, things work out, uh, I mean that they are mutually consistent and so on. So, I am going to skip that, those are for some, I mean for those of you who are not entirely convinced by some of these steps, but they are not terribly important. So, let us proceed. So, uh, so the point is that uh, this is the Green's function that I am going to be dealing with. Okay, so uh, so let me uh, go all the way here. Yeah, so this is the green. So this is the Green's function I'm going to be dealing with. So this see this one notation one uh, is a compact way of writing x one comma t one. Okay, so this is called Kedanov beam notation. So this was invent this uh, notation was invented by. Uh, the well known physicists Kadanoff and Bain in the early 60s when they wrote this textbook called Quantum Statistical Mechanics. So, that is where I learned all this from. Okay, um, point is that uh, there are these, uh, so again I instinctively forgot my h bar. So, the bottom line is that this Green's function which is now defined, uh, uh, it remember that the time ordering is now still on the imaginary axis. So, all these times uh, t 1, t 2, they all live on the imaginary axis between t equal to 0 and t equals minus b i beta h bar. So, this is clearly the equation of motion that means the equation, the time evolution equation obeyed by uh, this Green's function. See the, the thing is that uh, the reason why uh, we have chosen to uh, introduce this external source uh, is uh, I mean initially it seems like a uh, unnecessary uh, complication because after all we are only interested in studying the system at equilibrium but a system where the particles. Uh, perhaps are in contact with surroundings at some temperature, but more importantly they interact amongst themselves, but they are still in equilibrium. So, that means that there is uh, the Green's functions look the same if you decide to shift the origin of your time to somewhere else and they are also spatially homogeneous. That means that if you shift the origin of your coordinate system spatially also the the Green's function look the same. So, there is spatial and time homogeneity as well. So, that means the system is in equilibrium. So, if it is in equilibrium it is kind of uh, annoying to introduce uh, some external potential now that spoils all that uh, nice equilibrium property. But you will see that uh, it is important to do this because uh, the term that uh, involves interactions between particles can now be written, you see this what is this term that involves the interaction between particles? It involves four fermions that are two creation and two annihilations, whereas this Green's function involves one creation and one annihilation because that is how we defined it uh, somewhere here. So, it was defined like this, so it involves one creation and one annihilation, ok. So, these two are the same, this is the per, I mean this is the S matrix perturbation series uh, friendly version of this. So, this is the original average that I am looking at. So, this is uh, this is along the, the time ordering is along the imaginary axis remember. So, this time ordering is along this imaginary axis. So, this is the original definition. Now, uh, I replace the C's by C hats and this is kind of the same as I mean this is mathematically the same that is what I have done in all these steps this theorem basically shows that 
uh, this is same as this and this is basically involves the part of the uh, Hamiltonian this is the interaction picture it only involves part of the Hamiltonian that does not change with time the part that does change with time is lumped into the size matrix. So, bottom line is that uh, whatever this Green's function is it involves one creation one annihilation operator however its equation of motion now unfortunately seems to involve two creation and two annihilation now if you go ahead and write down the equation of motion for this it will involve three creation and three annihilation and so on and so forth endlessly and that's where you're stuck because then you uh, you don't have a convenient equation that you can solve so the whole point of introducing this device of uh, an external time dependent source is to see if you can go ahead and now express this this term which involves two annihilation two creation purely in terms of a Green's function that has only one annihilation one creation. So in fact I will show you in the next class that it, it is possible to do that. So if, if I am successful in showing you that then what this equation becomes is basically it becomes an equation involving a, a version of the Green's function which creates only one particle and annihilates only one particle and nothing else. It does not involve uh, Green's functions where you are annihilating two particles or creating two particles. So, I am going to stop here and in the next class uh, I am going to continue and uh, prove this important claim that uh, the terms uh, which I have written down here which involve creating and annihilating two particles that correspond to interactions between particles uh, can now be expressed purely in terms of uh, the Green's function involving one particle so long as I uh, involve the sources that I have artificially introduced into the problem. Okay, I am going to stop here and in the next class let us continue. Thank you. Mm -hmm.